Hello, everyone. We're going to give everyone a few moments to log on and join us. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. Welcome everyone. Just waiting a few more moments, giving people time to join. All right, we are going to get started. Hello everyone and welcome to Hawk Mountain Sanctuary's Stay at Home Speaker Series. Today's program is Ecological and Cultural Keystone Species, the Yurok Tribes California Condor Project with Todd Barnell, Waste and Response Manager for the Institute of Tribal Environmental Professionals. Welcome, Todd. Thank you so much, Jamie. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here and see you and um, welcome to everybody who's uh, here for the presentation. Thank you so much. My name is Jamie Dawson and I'm the Director of Education at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary. And we're so glad everyone is able to join us today or this morning or this evening, wherever you may be viewing from. <laughs> As you may know, Hawk Mountain is the world's very first refuge for birds of prey. And we continue to work hard to be leaders in raptor conservation, science and education locally and globally around the world. Hawk Mountain is a private nonprofit and membership is the lifeblood of our organization. To all of our members out there, thank you, thank you, thank you so very much for your continued support. We literally could not do what we do without you, so thank you. And if you're joining us today and you're not a member, we like you anyway, <laughs> and we hope that you consider becoming one in the future. Hawk Mountain hopes that everyone remains safe and healthy during these times of COVID challenges. And we love that we have the opportunity to provide our local and global community a variety of free virtual programming. But as always, Hawk Mountain greatly appreciates and depends on donations. Just so everyone is aware, today's program is being recorded. The video will then be accessible on Hawk Mountain's YouTube channel as a continued resource. We also have a link on our website that directly connects you to our YouTube channel. At any point during today's program, you can submit questions through the Q&A feature on the Zoom platform. And we've designated some time at the end of the program to take some questions from the audience. And we are so excited that Todd Barnell is joining us today all the way from beautiful Arizona uh, to teach us about his work with the native nations across the United States and also to share with us a presentation by Tiana Williams that highlights the Yurok Tribes California Condor Project. And before we go further, I'd like to take a moment to share some of Todd's background experience with our audience. Originally from Indiana, Todd and his partner moved to Flagstaff, Arizona in 1999, where he joined the Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals a few years later. He is the manager of ITEP's waste and response team and assists tribal professionals with their super fund emergency response, solid waste, underground storage tank and brown fields programs. Prior to joining ITEP, he worked as a welder, did PR for a music school, conducted field research on climate change and forest ecology projects and managed a local office for the Nature Conservancy. When he isn't working, he is usually birding, gardening, or reading. Pretty awesome stuff you're involved with, Todd. <laughs> so how did you become involved with the Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals? So as you were, you were mentioning in, in my bio there, Jamie, um, my professional, educational, and volunteer um, background is rather eclectic. Um, and so I was um, very fortunate in 2002 um, ITEP was actually um, hiring, and they wanted somebody that they could actually plug in um, to a variety of different positions. <laughs> um, so since I am completely a generalist, I am a specialist in absolutely nothing, um, <laughs> I fit the bill um, for what they were, they were looking, looking for. So when I um, joined ITEP, I did everything from developing an online library um, to doing research projects to help um, tribal professionals. 
um, I was doing solid waste trainings um, in Alaskan native villages above the Arctic Circle in the middle of winter. Um, so whenever anybody talks about how beautiful Alaska is, I've never seen Alaska except in February. Um, so eventually with ITEP, I was able to start, um, we're a 100% grant funded organization. And I was able to bring in some additional funding that allowed us to kind of expand some of the work that we were doing when it came to some of these land management um, issues and dealing with things like Superfund, um, which for the audience, um, you may remember Love Canal in New York back in the 70s, um, that was the first Superfund. Superfund sites are um, some of the most contaminated sites throughout the United States, and many of them affect um, Native nations here in the United States. So I was able to kind of like build, build that up. ITEP has been utterly fantastic for someone like me because um, while my background has been very eclectic, um, social and ecological injustice um, are the two things that have been consistent throughout my life of like wanting to be in positions where I can actually address those two issues. And ITEP gives me the creativity um, to work on those kind of things and to work with um, Native nations on helping them develop their own capacity so that they can actually meet these challenges um, and address them, so. Wow, wonderful. Such important work you get to do. It is. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing. And a little bird told me that you were visiting Hawk Mountain earlier this fall. <laughs> so would you mind sharing with our audience um, your personal connection to Hawk Mountain and what inspired you to visit? Yes. Um, so honestly, uh, the first thing was your podcast. Um, the Hawk's Call um, is something that when you first started it, um, I had just simply stumbled across it. Um, and one of the things that I do, which I'll talk about a little bit here later before um, we do the, the presentation, um, is my team and I, which there's only two people on my team, <laughs> um, we actually put on a national conference um, every year called the Tribal Lands and Environment Forum. And as part of that, I always have some sort of wildlife um, presentation that's actually done during our closing plenary. And so Ironically enough, right at the time that I was thinking, what in the world am I going to do for, because we've been, the last two years, we've done our conference virtually. Mm -hmm. Who am I going to have actually speak? And like, what's, what's going to be the subject this year? And the day that I was like tearing my hair out and I couldn't figure out which direction to go, the Hawk's Call came out. Um, and my, I was like, oh my gosh. I started listening to it and I was like, how have I never heard of Hawk <laughs> Sanctuary? <laughs> um, I was absolutely transfixed, listened to all the podcasts, immediately went to your website. Um, I blew an entire workday, um, actually just going through your website and watching some of your past presentations. Um, and I was not only impressed with the science and obviously the, the incredibly important work that you all are actually doing, um, what really got me was your commitment to diversity. Um, I have never come across another organization that has such an incredibly high commitment to having diverse voices. And the fact that you've done such an amazing job of reaching out to women, um, as well as people of color and people around the world um, and different perspectives, I was absolutely transfixed. And as I was kind of like learning more about Hawk Mountain, um, I had not taken a week off of work in like two and a half years. Um, and so I made the mistake of not even going on vacation before the pandemic. So that really kind of screwed things up. Once I got vaccinated, once I kind of thought that maybe I had like a slight window of opportunity, I was like, I'm getting out of here and I want to go to Hawk Mountain. Um, and I spent six days um, at Hawk Mountain. And what really tripped my trigger was I found out that you were actually doing International um, Vulture Appreciation Day. I love vultures. I love, love, love vultures. So even though it was my partner of 25 years birthday um, on that day, um, she was like, go. <laughs> <laughs> just go. Gave me permission to miss her birthday this year. Um, and I had an absolutely fantastic time. And that's when I started thinking, California condors, Yurok tribe, that's what I'm going to do for my conference. So I kind of learned about Hawk Mountain and completely fell in love with you all um, at exactly the same time that I was trying to figure out what I was going to do for my own conference. So it was a, it was a lovely combination, actually, of um, different things coming together at the same time. I love it. I love that story and um, love the whole town shirt as well. <laughs> so well, thank I had, you. To, had to get one. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I love that connection. And uh, oh man, I cannot wait to hear 
about the California Condor Project. So um, Todd, I'm gonna to turn it over to you for your presentation. Okay, perfect. Um, so thank you again, Jamie. Thank you to everybody at Hawk Mountain who um, makes this possible. Thanks to all of you um, who are actually taking the time. Um, what I'm going to do today is I'm actually gonna share with you a presentation um, that was done by um, Tiana Williams. She is the wildlife director at the Yurok tribe, which is based in um, um, Northern California. And as I mentioned, what I have been doing for years is <clears throat> ending our conference with a presentation that deals with some type of wildlife conservation um, that is being done by a tribal nation. And that may seem a little bit strange because as Jamie was mentioning in my biography, what I work on and what my conference is actually focused on addresses things like super fun contaminated sites, waste issues, emergency response. We don't do wildlife. Um, however, <laughs> many years ago, I was actually kind of thinking to myself, when I end these conferences, I would really like to do something that kind of brings us all full circle. And the kind of work that that my colleagues and friends at tribal nations across the country um, work on are pretty grim. Um, they are very depressing. <laughs> um, they are massively contaminated lands that have been affected by lead, uranium, um, you name it. And it can kind of bring you down a little bit. <clears throat> and that's one of the things that I actually like is that our conference, the people who come to it always tell me that the Tribal Lands and Environment Forum feeds their soul and their heart as well as their mind. And I really take that seriously. Like that's, that's a responsibility that I've got to make sure that I'm, I'm actually doing that. Um, so by ending our conference, by sharing stories of tribal professionals, protecting and even bringing back um, our relations, um, whether they be feathered, whether they be finned, um, whether they walk on four legs or two, helping to bring back those relations um, is something that people actually have, they really love about the TLEF, that we get to end it on a positive note. Um, and so this year, as I was mentioning, um, our, present, our final presentation was um, on the Yurok tribe's work on bringing back the California condor. So Tiana, um, did this presentation and I'm going to be sharing with you the recording that was actually the ending of our conference um, this last August. And Tiana gave me permission. She was like, I'd love it for you to go ahead and share it with um, Hawk Mountain Sanctuary and all of their supporters. So that's the um, presentation that I'm actually gonna be showing you. Um, this presentation is about 44 minutes long. Um, so hopefully we'll have like a little bit of time for any kind of questions. I will attempt to answer any questions that I possibly can. Um, some of your questions I might not be able to answer, which is totally fine. If I can't, um, I will definitely be giving um, you contact information. You are more than welcome to actually go ahead and contact the Yurok tribe um, directly. So with that, I am going to go ahead and share my screen. And I'm going to um, show this presentation. I can get this fired up. Okay, hopefully that is now showing up. Yep, looks good. Okay, perfect. Then I'm going to go ahead and um, get this playing for you all. My name is uh, Tiana Williams Clausen, and I'm the director for the Iraq Tribes Wildlife Department. Um, and I'm very honored to talk about a project that honestly has been pretty much my life's work since I got out of college, which is bringing California condor back to my home in, in Yurok Ancestral Territory in Northern California. And I'm hoping to be able to, by the end of this uh, presentation, really explain how this is both cultural and ecological restoration in the Pacific Northwest, and to just really highlight the different partnerships and the different disciplines that have uh, been able to make this happen. So I'm going to start with a bit of an introduction to the bird itself, just in case you're not familiar with California condor. Um, they're actually the largest land-based bird in North America. They're pretty cool. They've got a wingspan of nine to nine and a half feet, and they can weigh as much as 25 pounds. We say that their lifespan is unknown because we just haven't been studying them long enough to know how long they live, and they live a very long time. We do know that their near cousin, the Andean condor, can live as much as 80 years in captivity, and we would expect something pretty similar 
from a California condor. So that's pretty cool. Uh, ecologically speaking, environmentally speaking, they, they serve the role of a giant obligate scavenger. So basically they're a vulture. They're kind of probably a bit of a, an analog for some of the people who might be here. They're a cleanup crew of our environment. They go across the landscape and help help the decomposition process for those animals that might otherwise not be able to be broken down and re-enter the system, making them a very important part of our system. They haven't actually lived in Yurok country for over 100 years now, so that's an environmental niche that's been empty since their disappearance. They are a monogamous species. They form lifelong pair bonds, um, really focusing on being good parents, laying only one egg every other year and then actually staying with that chick for the full two years of that cycle before they send them off on their own. They'll incubate the egg for 56 to uh, 58 days and uh, the chick won't actually fledge for six to seven months. It won't reach full maturity until six to eight years, which is very, very, very slow for a bird. And this is all really relevant to their reproductive rate, um, which is very slow. Uh, for example, if you do a comparison to a similar species, eagles, they can actually have two to three chicks every year. So over a period of 10 years, you'd have 20 to 30 new eagles, whereas under ideal situations, you'd only have five new condors. Now, that's important because unfortunately, their reproductive rate is too slow to keep up with their current mortality rate, making them a highly endangered species, which is really unfortunate because they're actually a very adaptable species, um, kind of in that Pleistocene era. They actually ranged all the way up into what's now British Columbia, down into Mexico, across what's now the United States and up into New York. So a very adaptable sort of species, a good survivor. But by the 1850s, their range had shrunk to kind of this gray area that you see here. And by the 1950s had shrunk to that red wishbone in the central part of California. It got so bad that they actually were diminished to just 22 individuals left in the entire world by 1982. And those declines were unfortunately almost exclusively human caused um, and associated with the destruction that came along with colonization. So one of the major impacts was a reduction in megafauna, the large game that they prefer, so deer, elk, bear, seals, and sea lions, all of which were impacted by the much larger human influx um, but were also impacted by market harvest, which killed a lot more animals than needed to be killed and decimated these populations. There was direct human take. People would kill condors, people would steal their eggs. There was habitat loss. In our region, that meant the raising of our old growth redwoods. They rely on them for nesting and roosting. And also the loss of our capacity to maintain our prairie system, which we used to do extensively through prescribed burn, but the capacity that was taken from us when we were forced off of our lands. And talking to our environmental program, awesome folks, particularly Joe Hostler, he says that only 1% of our traditional prairies are still there because they might have been planted over for timber or they've been encroached upon because of the lack of fire. There was also poisoning. People would put out poison for carnivores like wolves or, or bears um, because they didn't like them attacking their livestock and condors would be, would be killed by those poison carcasses. And two contaminants which remain an issue today and which I'll talk about more in my presentation are actually residual DDT contamination and actually lead toxicity. The picture over that you can see there is a, a radiograph of an animal that has lead shot in it, uh, lead ammunition being one of the primary ways that lead's getting into the system and which I'll talk about more. Very highly toxic to conflict. But in summation, pretty much exclusively human caused uh, their declines. In any case, the high mortalities in the mid-1980s drove this really controversial decision to bring all remaining birds into captivity in the hopes of starting a captive rearing program. This is a picture of a, an egg being candled at the San Diego Wild Animal Park, which is, um, I think they're called San Diego Global these days, but they've got one of the breeding and rearing facilities for condors there. And it was actually very successful. They didn't know if they'd breed in captivity, but within the first two or three years, they actually did have successful matings happen happening, and they had successful chicks born uh, shortly thereafter. It was successful enough that by the mid-1990s, they were re-releasing birds into the wild. And as of December 2020, there was actually 504 birds total with 329 living in the wild, up from that all-time low of just 22 individuals. 
But the question remains, of, is the population as it exists sustainable? Because they're largely focused in central and southern California and parts of the Southwest, particularly in the areas that they're in California, they're already experiencing continued pressure from humans. And it's only expected to get worse with time as these populations grow. So current anthropogenic threats that remain an impact to condors are power line collisions, lead toxicity, and organochlorines, again, mostly referencing DDT there. The Yurok tribe um, has had a different vision, which I love how this is portrayed. It's portrayed by our local artist, Carrie Bloomfield, who has painted California condors flying over our mountains, flying over our rivers in what is a relatively pristine environment compared to some of the areas that they're persisting in now. We want to bring them home to Yurok country in far northern California. So if you're not familiar with this, it sounds like we've got reps from the Yurok tribe here. I'm, I'm glad to see that. Um, other representatives from Northern California, but this is us. We are very near the Oregon border. That kind of red boundary that you see there, that polygon is our ancestral territory. The red boundary around what is the Klamath River, the narrow strip there is our reservation. It's about 10% of our ancestral territory. And we are proposing releasing condors within Yurok ancestral territory, actually on Redwood National and State Parks lands. They've been a partner with us from nearly the beginning. That kind of green boundary is the overlap there. Uh, but basically returning condor to Yurok ancestral territory to meet both tribal and Redwood National Park conservation and restoration uh, priorities. The little inset map uh, in the corner shows where the existing release sites are in California and, and us in the purple is where our new site to the north is going to be. Now this is driven from a cultural perspective, but it's also driven from the government perspective. Um, the Yurok Constitution mandates that we preserve and promote our culture, language, and religious beliefs and practices, to which condor are very tied and pass them on in perpetuity. And also that we restore and enhance the tribal fishery, water rights, forest, and other natural resources, which include, of course, our wildlife community members. <clears throat> Ultimately, the decision to return condor to Yorok ancestral territory was made by the Tribal Park Task Force, which was a task force of tribal elders specifically chosen for their ability to prioritize natural and cultural resource restoration needs. And they made that decision all the way back in 2003 that condors Reganish in our language was the single most important species to bring back to ancestral territory um, in terms of land based animals. We're a salmon people, so salmon and sturgeon actually came out the top two, but condors was right at the top uh, when it came to land based animals. And that largely relates to our cultural and spiritual relationship with him. Uh, for us, condor is Hoitbasan, or one of the highest of the animals, spiritually speaking. In the words of our former councilman and a cultural leader, Richard Myers, it can soar the highest. So we figured that was the one to get our prayers to heaven when we are asking for the world to be in balance. Uh, many Yurok families like my own teach that he's never to be harmed and feathers are considered to be gifts from the condors. Um, in, particularly, in particular, he ties very closely to our jump dance and our white deerskin dance, which are world renewal ceremonies. And I love this piece of art. It's my local artist. Lynn Rosling, who's actually Karuk, Yurok, and Hupa descent. And it kind of depicts these world renewal ceremonies in a very vibrant way that shows that they still remain a vibrant part of our communities. This isn't just a Yurok thing. The Karuk tribe, the Hupa, the Wiat, the Talawa, all of our surrounding tribes are world renewal people. It's what we consider to be our foundational reason for being. Now in our stories, they go all the way back to the beginning of time when these ceremonies were being developed. Um, at that time, Condor gave us his song, which we sing as a prayer in these ceremonies, these high ceremonies, and he provides his feathers and spirits to the dance, which we use in our regalia. And he carries our prayers to heavens when we're asking for the world to be in balance, which again is our primary reason for being here as, as tribal people in this region. The next, and I have to, I've practiced this next part so many times and it's the most complicated for me to portray. So we'll see how this goes. But what I really want to, the next step that I want to take, I've kind of shown you the ecological, the environmental role that condor play and the cultural role that condor play. But I go further to say that they're actually a keystone species in both respects. And I say it's complicated because as tribal people, of course, we understand that the ecology and the culture are very closely intertwined. 
And so it's hard to differentiate these two steps. But an ecological keystone species, at least by some definitions, is of course a species that seems to have kind of a larger impact on its environment than might be explained by, a by its relative population. And a cultural keystone species is one that um, really drives the cultural narrative of a region. These two things cross over in two ways, I'd say, both in the way, but I'd say actually primarily in the way that we relate to condors, the relationship that we have with condors between condors and humans and with humans and condors. And I'm going to go into that a little bit more. Um, one of the ways that condor really serves as function as kind of a, a keystone species is as an indicator species. Um, to have a healthy and abundant condor population, you have to have a healthy environment. If you don't have a healthy environment, you don't have a healthy condor population. And so a lot of the things that went into reducing our condor population have impacted the system as a whole, including the Yurok people. So there's a lot of ties and parallels between condors extirpation in our region and our near extirpation in our region. And things like, including like reduction of that megafauna that they relied on. We also relied on that megafauna and existed in relationship as caretakers and recipients of their lives. They as a lesser species suffered from human take, people killed them we were considered lesser and it was we suffered under massacres and the theft of our children so that they could be rewritten into a new paradigm that was better of course that's not better they suffered under habitat loss we suffered removal from our home um, breaking connections from both cultural and ecological ties that we had they suffered poisoning and contaminants like ddt and lead toxicity and of course there's a whole host of new toxic elements introduced with colonization for us as tribal people as well. So there's just a lot of parallels that as our world was so heavily disrupted, condors were extirpated and we were brought to the brink of extinction. It's actually exemplified through a, a very clear parallel between a kind of our condor vitality and our cultural vitality. Because as condors were disappearing from our landscape in the late part of the 19th century, early part of the 20th century, so did we come very close to losing our white deerskin bands depicted here in the early part of the 20th century. And as a reminder, this is one of our high ceremonies and representative of who we are as tribal people, as world renewal people. So that's a big deal. We actually hadn't danced it since the early part of the 20th century through a combination of, of reasons. One, of course, it was illegal to practice tribal religion. Two, we had lost access to a lot of the lands that these dances are reliant on. Our regalia had been taken from us and poisoned and put in museums. And unfortunately, we weren't that healthy because of all the destruction that we had experienced. So we didn't dance for many, many, many years. But um, in the early part of the 21st century, starting before that, but really getting implemented in the first part of the 21st century, we reinstituted this dance, um, particularly under the leadership of one of our eldest of elders, who was one of the last who had actually danced the white deerskin dance in his youth. And there's a couple of connections to condor here. I mean, obviously, there's that we use their feathers in the regalia. And so that's an important condor connection. But another was, and when I'm learning about this, I'm learning from an elder from someone who I look up to as very wise and knowledgeable. And he tells me that this eldest of elders said, we're going to start with a condor song, because it's one of the most important parts of this ceremony. And this elder that I'm talking to, and who I respect and admire, tells me, I didn't even know Condor was a part of these world renewal ceremonies. And that's because it had been so long since we'd had this dance, but also because it had been so long since we'd had Condor as a regular part of our community, that we were very much at risk of not only losing that relationship, but even losing the remembrance of that relationship. So there's a very clear tie there between our cultural restoration and our condor restoration. There's the second tie that I was mentioning was that it was actually about that same time that our tribal park task force was making this decision that we needed to bring condor home. And that ties to our cultural revitalization, that ties to rebuilding ourselves as a world renewal people. We never lost that capacity, but we certainly struggled in our ability to implement it. And so Condor was decided as this representative of world renewal to be a really excellent case, a kind of a flagship species for getting wildlife restoration going in general for the Yurok tribe. They, in fact, were the flagship species for the Yurok tribe wildlife department, which got started in 2008 
uh, with the aim of bringing Condor home. So now these dances are healing the world again, and we are actually on the brink of restoring condors. Um, I said that we started as a department in 2008. It's now 2021. We're looking at re reintroducing condors to our landscape next year. It's been a long process, but I'm just very excited that we are getting there. And so all of that stuff was actually very heavy. Um, and I, I just want to, I think, take a, a step back get back into our, our, our human selves again and talk about the nitty gritty of how we got here and where we're going and what we're doing to, to reintroduce condors to our region. So I'm gonna start with a brief history of our project. In other words, how do we get there and then move on to our next steps from there. So like I said, we got started in 2008. It was actually through funding from a US Fish and Wildlife Service grant to begin habitat analyses because while we knew as tribal people that they had thrived in our region, one that wasn't probably enough for the federal government and two we ourselves wanted to be sure that those things that had caused extirpation in our region weren't still going to keep condors from um, being able to thrive in our region so some of the major questions that we aimed to answer was is there available habitat for condors to carry out necessary life history activities will marine mammal derived organic chlorine contaminants limit recovery in northern california again primarily referencing ddt and their um, and their offshoots. Will lead limit recovery in Northern California, referencing that lead ammunition problem? And what are the attitudes of Northern California hunters? And will they accept non-lead ammunition as a viable alternative? So um, I, I'm a GIS nerd, so I'm gonna, I'm so I'm pained by how quickly I'm gonna go over this, but really that's what we did. We did a GIS analysis looking at their life history needs focused on um, on um, on nesting, on roosting, on foraging, and on flight corridors. And a lot of that is reliant on terrain that not even the worst catastrophe, human caused catastrophe in any case can change. And so a lot of those those habitat requirements still remain strong in our region. The big if was whether our food resources would be abundant enough, but thankfully conservation has changed in this country quite a bit since condors were first extirpated. And a lot of those species that have been greatly diminished are instead greatly rebounding at this point. So there's ample high quality condor habitat in your country at this point. The next big component that we looked at was the, the threat from DDT. So of course, most here probably know that we stopped using DDT in the 1970s. Um, you're, a lot of you are probably familiar with Silent Spring and brown pelicans and things like that. But DDT, and since we've banned DDT, there's actually been a lot of positive response from our wildlife community members. Um, but condors are still being impacted. And that's because DDT is a persistent organic pollutant, lasts a long time in the environment, and it's also lipophilic, so it's fat binding, and it binds to these long-lived blubbery animals like seals, California sea lions, and whales, um, which bioaccumulate over their lifetime. Now, while they're out and about and doing their thing, it's not such a big issue, but when they die and are stranded on our beaches, they then become condor food, and they then become these kind of DDT bombs. And the issue with DDT, of course, is that it is an eggshell thinner. This is an example of a healthy egg that is not impacted by DDT. It has what's called a surface crystalline layer that offers integrity and strength to the egg. This is an example of an egg that is impacted by DDT, a condor egg, and it's lacking that surface crystalline layer. So without that, that egg breaks easily and it also loses a lot of water. Without human intervention, that egg will die. And a lot of times even with human intervention, that egg will die. This particular one was from the Central California flock, which is managed by the Ventana Wildlife Society, and they do a lot of coastal food resource um, scavenging. They're in fact the only condor location that really does that. So this is kind of our, this is where we look to see if condors are having a problem with DDT. So what we did is we actually studied every marine mammal we could get our hands on, but this is a snapshot particularly of male California sea lions. And we looked at male California sea lions because they are the biggest, they are the fattest, and they don't lose DDT to their offspring, which actually females do when they, when they nurse. 
So this is kind of a, a graph of a comparative analysis of DDT levels. On the far left, that tall bar there in red is actually the Southern California bite where the Montrose chemical spill happened. We call it a spill, but it was really just a dumping of DDT into the Southern California bite. Some of you may have seen a few months ago, they just found something like 25,000 barrels of DDT down there in Southern California bite. Obviously, their marine mammals are very contaminated. Our concern with California sea lions is that they would be traveling down south, farther south, picking up DDT as a migratory species and then coming back and dying on our shores. The central bar there is actually central California, where I said that they have an issue with DDT. Now, they're in the somewhat good position that only about 50% of their eggs are being impacted by DDT. So they're on the upswing. DDT levels are going down. We're hopeful that within some time within the foreseeable future, they will now have reproductive, positive reproduction without too much impact from DDT. The even better news for Northern California and parts north of us is that we're actually four times lower than the Central California flock. I won't know till condors are here and breeding, but I'm very hopeful that that means that condors will be able to successfully breed in Northern California shores. So that's good. And that's like a major win on my part, on, in my heart, uh, for DDT having been banned for use in, in California, or I mean, in the United States, excuse me. The next issue that we studied is actually our biggest concern and remains our biggest concern, which is the potential threat from the use of lead ammunition contaminating our environments. So, and the way that we got at this because we don't have condors to look at um, is looking at uh, avian surrogates. So turkey vultures and common ravens who are scavengers and might provide something of a snapshot of the environmental contaminants that a condor might find. To go into a little bit more issue with lead or more detail with lead. Of course, the problem with lead is that it's poisonous, which we know. In humans, we know that it affects behavior and development and is now known to affect virtually every system in the body. So the way that it's getting into the environment most prevalently is through the use of lead ammunition, lead being the most conventionally used material for ammunition. Now, lead is a very effective ammunition, which from my perspective as a hunter and coming from a hunting family is very important because that means it's got lots of good knockdown power for an animal. You get a quick clean kill. But the issue is that it fragments heavily on impact. This is a picture of a deer thorax uh, taken with, it was killed with a seven millimeter Remington Magnum. And you can see that there's actually 547 lead fragments within this deer thorax. A piece as small as the head of a pin is enough to kill a condor. So if these lead fragments are getting into a gut pile and the gut pile is getting left behind, which is pretty conventional, um, that should be good food for scavengers. That's actually a really important role that hunters play, but not when it's contaminated with lead like this. So like I said, lead is the most conventionally used material for ammunition. And so we expected that there would be a problem. These are our results, um, particularly looking at turkey vultures. Again, we're the leftmost bar there it's green and it says 24%. So that means that 24% of the turkey vultures that we studied were found to have an elevated blood lead level high enough that it would be an impact to a condor and that's considered about 10 micrograms per deciliter. Now our study was confounded a little bit because you can only study turkey vultures outside of the hunting season because they're actually migrating in the hunting season and you can't be sure that the contaminant load that you're seeing is from the region you're studying. But there was a study done in Mendocino County, just south of us, which was able, because of a difference in migratory timelines, able to look inside and outside of hunting season. So that central bar, that 36% is outside of hunting season, and that blue bar, the 66% is inside of hunting season. So there is a clear differential in the amount of lead that these scavengers are getting into within hunting season, indicating it's probable that lead ammunition is gonna be a problem in our region. We, did our study with common ravens as well. The thing about them is they're non-migratory and we saw a similar spread both inside and outside of hunting season. Now, the good news for both turkey vultures and common ravens is that though we do clearly have an issue, we had fewer individuals being impacted overall than in other areas studied, including in areas where condors are thriving right now. That doesn't mean it's not gonna be a problem. It is going to be a problem. 
but hopefully it will be a less common problem than in these other regions. Though it's so toxic, I mean, who can really say? But in order to combat this, and this is really where condor as kind of this keystone species comes in. We wanted to make change in our environment and all, and this is something that's duplicated across the condor reintroductions program throughout, the, throughout California and the Southwest by reaching out to the hunters in order to make a change in their hearts to non-lead ammunition. And that's why we started our hunters as stewards but with condor as a flagship species to kind of help prompt people along to make that change. And while I'm talking a lot about condors, again, we get back to this kind of more keystone aspect because lead isn't just an issue for wildlife or for condors. I mean, it's just, it's an issue for more than one wildlife species out there. So what we're really trying to do with this Hunters and Stewards pro project was to really listen to hunters' concerns and respond to them, communicating our information clearly to them about why lead ammunition was a problem, why hunting wasn't a problem, hunting was in fact a part of the solution, but that we needed transition, needed to transition to non-lead alternatives. Our primary message was that lead is a toxic material and non-lead ammunition is better for wildlife. And again, it's not just condors, but for example, eagles are just as susceptible to lead contamination. They just breed faster, so it doesn't impact them as heavily as a population. But furthermore, it's better for you and your family and your friends. And that comes from um, there's actually been several studies, but one that I particularly like was done out of the Midwest, um, kind of in the Wisconsin area, actually more, where um, an individual took it upon himself to start radiographing uh, deer meat that had been shot with lead, but which had, and which had been processed as it is typically processed, and seeing how much lead was getting into the meat. And he found that 20% of the meat that had been processed and was intended for human consumption actually had lead contamination in it. And while that might not be so much of an issue for me or for most of the people here, it's definitely an issue for our youth. And there's actually been since then, the CDC has come out with a recommendation that kids five and under during that really important neurological development phase do not be fed any game that has been taken with lead ammunition because of the chance that they'd be eating lead. Now, since then as well, California has actually put a ban in place, again, with Condor kind of as the leader um, or, or the lead reason for that, they've put a full ban in place on using lead ammunition for hunting. And as you might expect, I mean, myself, like I said, I'm a hunter, I come from California, I come from probably one of the uh, more conservative parts of California, I'd say in Del Mar County. It was very controversial within the hunting community. While within our Hunters as Stewards project, anywhere from 85 to 95% of the individuals that we were talking to said, absolutely, I get it, I'm gonna make the switch. It was definitely a one-on-one -on -one sort of conversation that needed to be had because this is such a strong tradition. It's such a strong heritage. And honestly, there's been so much, there's so much guns and ammunition regulation in California that hunters are a little bit, well, unintended gun shy of it. So the new ban was put in place fully by 2019. We'll see how it goes. Programs like the Hunters and Stewards Project are still really important. It's really important that hunters um, overall get on board with making the switch to non-lead ammunition. It is exacerbated because there's a lot of ammunition shortages right now. So even if you want to, it's hard to find, find the non-lead that you want. It's complicated and it's complex, but it's really going to be the, um, it's going to be the reason that condors thrive or do not thrive. I think I failed to mention earlier that actually 50% of known condor mortalities are related to um, lead contamination. So 50% of animals that we know that die in the wild are dying because of lead contamination. So this really has to be addressed and we're continuing to push forward with that. But we've been doing a lot of stuff in the meantime. It's been 13 years now, over 13 years since we got started. Um, a really important component. And again, another way that Condor is serving as the lead and kind of bringing people together for this is in supporting and establishing and formal support from our partners in the region. So one of the big agreements that we've got actually is a 16 entity uh, memorandum of understanding in support of condor reintroduction in our region, which we started drafting in February of 2012 and got final signatories in 2008. But it includes federal partners like the US Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Park Service, which we're partnering with, but also the BLM and the US Forest Service, of course, the Yurok tribe, 
It's expanded for state entities like California and Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, California Parks and Recreation. They're actually one of the original signatories. Um, we've got nonprofits like the Oregon Zoo and Sequoia Zoo, Ventana Wildlife Society, Oakland Zoo, and actually utility companies. You remember that I mentioned power lines were an issue in Condor Country. So Pacific Gas and Electric and Pacific Power Company, and actually industry leaders like our local, our local Green Diamond Resource Company, um, which is a timber company as well as the Hell's Canyon Preservation Council on California Condor Conservation. They're actually based out of kind of the Idaho, kind of on the border of Idaho and Oregon, and they're looking to reintroduce condors in their region as well in the future. But this is a lot of talk about what we've been up to, why it's important. I think the really exciting thing is what's next for condors on the north coast of California. So we've actually been embroiled really for the last six years in the regulatory process. Um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service proposed that they be reintroduced as a non-essential experimental population under Section 10J of the Endangered Species Act. And that actually kind of arose out of these partnerships that we built. If you'll hark back to one of my earliest slides, condors are actually pretty dang adaptable. It's really these human impacts that are driving them under. How we use the landscape on a whole, I mean, if you can fly 100 to 200 miles in a day, which condors can, you know, it takes a lot to impact the condor. And so we worked with our partners to develop a kind of targeted approach to conservation that really supports those things that condors really need to thrive, but also allows flexibility for our land management partners so that they can continue to conduct activities and condors coming back ends up being a good thing for everybody. So that's why the 10J designation was proposed. Um, as is typical with NEPA, there's at least two alternatives. In this case, there is three. There's the no action alternative, which is you always include the designation as 10J under the ESA and then ESA fully protected. So we, we the preferred was the designated 10J um, and it ended up taking us four years of actual concerted um, environmental assessment process. We got literally thousands of comments, which is an incredible amount of comments on this sort of thing. Um, but ultimately resulted in a finding of no significant impact, which was received on March 23rd of this year. So again, that's culminating 13 years of work towards this moment. This is basically us saying, yes, we can move forward and reintroduce condors to your country, which is amazing. That's where we're at right now. Meanwhile, we've also been building kind of, I would call the implementation partnerships. We already had a really strong partnership with the Redwood National State Parks. We're going to be releasing on their lands, but we've also been drafting new agreements related to bird treatment and facility uses and partner roles and responsibilities. Um, we've submitted management plans and permit applications, which we're hoping to get wrapped up in the next few months. And we've developed a specific cooperative agreement with Redwood National and State Parks, kind of creating what we call the Northern California Condor Restoration Program. And that's just highlighting that we're a joint program between the parks and the tribe to make restoration happen in our region. We've also been really investing in the necessary infrastructure, like what we're calling our Condor Management and Operations Center. This was actually an old uh, Redwood National and State Parks building that had been slated to be demolished. It was in no sort of good shape. Um, but we received funding from the Administration for Native Americans to revamp it, to renovate it, and it's going to be our office and storage space. It's going to have a walk-in freezer for carcasses. There's a workshop area. There's a staging area for field operations. Um, we've also been working specifically with the Sequoia Park Zoo to develop a local treatment facility. They're based out of Eureka, California, which is very close to where we're at. And what they're doing is building one of these, which is a condor, condor quarantine and treatment facility for those birds which might be injured or need, um, for example, chelation treatment for lead contamination. I don't think I said that either, but that's primarily our, our first line of defense against lead contamination in these birds is chelation, which it gets the job done, but it's hard on the birds, so we still want to get lead out of the environment. This is kind of a schematic of what they've designed. It's going to be on their properties. It's going to have multiple rooms so that if a bird needs to be very isolated, it can be, but it can also have community because they're a very community oriented bird um, with the bird next to it. We're also, I, I say finalizing the design of the release and management facility, but we're pretty much there at this point. 
it looks at it looks it's going to look something like this and this is actually the release and management facility at pinnacles national park it's one of the management organization it's comprised of three components there's the flight pen which is kind of that big open space and where birds spend the majority of their time the observation room which as you might guess we observe the birds we can do it unseen through one-way glass we've got to stay really quiet though and it's also kind of where we process birds if we need to lay hands on them to repair transmitters or check blood lead, blood lead levels. The third component is the double door trap. It's kind of that little square you see in the front. And I always think of it as kind of a funnel. You can put a carcass in there and either lure birds into it and then funnel them into the facility, or when you're ready to release them, lure them into it and, and let them go out of the facility. This is an example of the same at the Ventana Wildlife Society. Um, and this is actually something closest to what we'll be creating. It's, and it's really neat because on the one hand, it's fully mobile. So that if for some reason the site we've picked isn't going to work out, we can pick up and move it someplace else. It's also entirely fireproof, which is going to be really important with the upcoming, I mean, fire is already incredibly terrible in California right now, the whole West Coast. It's only going to get worse. And for example, Ventana, has lost several sites to fire. They're actually rebuilding right now from fires that swept through last year. So this sort of, of setup is gonna be really important for the long-term longevity of this project. We have actually broken ground, which is super exciting. That happened just back in July. I've been waiting for this day forever. Um, and we're hoping to be able to be releasing birds in uh, spring of 2022. A lot of people are very interested in our management and release strategies that we're going to be implementing. So some of those are that we're hoping to get six birds per year. Actually, these are birds that are begin, going to be juvenile birds coming from the rearing facilities. They're going to be about two years of age. Um, they'll be allowed to acclimatize in the field release management facility for several months to kind of get them used to their new home and kind of hone it in as this is their new home. Uh, releases will occur as pairs or singly. There's a couple of reasons for that. The one is um, we want to make sure that individual birds are doing well. We can put really focused attention on them as they move out. But two, it also means that there's going to be birds left in the facility and they are very community oriented birds. So this helps keep these young birds close to home where we can keep a good eye on them. We're hoping to be able to bring in mentors from the zoos. So these are older condors that for some reason can't be released, either injury or they just didn't do well in the wild, but who still have a lot of value as individuals and as teachers of these young birds about how to be condors. Um, that'll also help them establish dominance hierarchies. It'll focus their attention on adult type behavior. And again, they act as kind of these social magnets to keep these birds close to home so that we can keep a good eye on them until we're sure that they're really confident in the air. All birds will be outfitted with transmitters and tags, including a single wing mounted transmitter and potentially a single tail mounted radio transmitter as well. Um, we're actually looking at a combo sort of transmitter, but this allows us to uh, conduct both broad range sort of analyses. So where they're going across the whole landscape, what are their home ranges, what risks are they encountering, what sort of habitat are they using, what sort of resources are they finding? Um, and it also allows us through the radio tags to actually go and lay eyes on them if there's an issue. Um, for example, all the tags have a mortality signal. If the bird doesn't move in so long, three days, so I, you could set it for different lengths, we know that something's going on with this bird and we can go lay eyes on it, make sure that it's doing okay or if it needs help. It's also going to really be really important, important for prioritizing engagement with landowners because we'll see where condors are going or where we think that they're going to go, um, identify what sort of resources might be on that land manager's land, and then engage with those landowners and managers to make sure that there aren't any harmful um, components to their management or harmful attributes to their landscape that we can then mitigate against. So it's going to be a really big partnership building tool. We have been regularly engaging with the existing release facilities for training in this, but we'll also ourselves be doing biannual trap ups, usually in the spring and fall. And so that's going to be for physical checks of the birds, for checks of the transmitters and tag maintenance, for blood draws to check for lead contamination or disease. And then, um, like I said, we've done training opportunities with other facilities. We will be providing training opportunities um, with our partners as well so that we can expand 
our capacity beyond the Yurok tribe to others who might be able to help us out with bond or reintroduction. This, for example, is an example of the Sequoia Park Zoo staff at the Oregon Zoo preparing a condor for transfer to a future release site. Um, I myself have been down to the Ventana Wildlife Society uh, site releasing birds. That's me in the middle looking pretty terrified <laughs> learning how to release a condor. Um, ultimately, the long-term vision that we are, we are hoping for here is that the lower human populations in the Pacific Northwest may reduce human and condor conflict such that we're we're not going to have as many issues as we're seeing in these other sites. I don't know if that's going to be the case. The proof is going to be in the pudding, but that's what we're hoping for. We're kind of with a target of six birds per year. That means that we're looking at 120 birds released over 20 years. We will be suffering mortalities there. We will be, we will be getting reproduction as well. So we'll see how many birds that actually means, but that's our target. And also we see Northern California as kind of just the next phase in condor recovery, representing a gateway to the Pacific Northwest. So what you see here in the red is kind of based off of some habitat analyses that we've done that say that these red areas are actually really prime condor habitat. So yes, we're releasing them just south of the Oregon border, but we're hoping that they will expand not only further into kind of our Northern California ranges, but up into the Pacific Northwest, up along the coast, up along the Columbia River, River where we know that historically they were, we'd like to see them again. Ultimately, our goal is to have birds without tags that we don't have to manage and are free flying and healthy and abundant throughout the Pacific Northwest. I always like to close with this just because it's really important to me as a tribal member that this is restoration across generations. Um, I am, of course, doing this for my elders. Uh, this is a, a couple pictures of, of a Yurok tribal member and a, a select the Kilma tribal member who have since passed, but who just loved our project so much, who were really, in particular, the gentleman on the left was very instrumental in getting this project going. And every time I talk to the lady, and we just, we don't say names from the Yurok perspective because they passed on and that's, and that's, we don't want to reference them in that way, but they just prayed so hard for us. So many have prayed so hard for us and we've lost so many along the way. So we're doing it for our elders. We're doing it for my own generation. I've learned so much. I've grown so much because of this project. I myself am really excited to be doing it for the next generation. This is a picture of my baby doll when she was just nine years old. Um, she's going to be the first generation of Yurok children who grow up with condors in their sky. She's never going to have them missing from her heart they're always going to be a part of her community. So with that, I um, I really like to close with this picture because there's actually 22 condors in this snapshot uh, taken down in Southern California. You'll remember that was the all time low at one point. So it's really exciting to see that that's a possibility. I want to extend my thanks to everybody who's helped out so far. This is just a snapshot of some of the people who have helped us out. It would be impossible to fit everybody on here, but it's definitely been a major collaborative effort. I want to say my thanks to you for your attention. This was really fast because I had a lot of information to portray. So I'm sorry if something wasn't clear or if I if I just spoke too quickly. You can find more information about us at yourofftribe.org slash wildlife. And if you have any specific questions, you can email me directly. Uh, that's my email, tiana at yourofftribe.nsn.us. And again, I just want to say wow, thank you very much for having me here and giving me the opportunity to share our story. That was amazing. Wow. I sincerely hope um, all of you found that um, of interest um, and as inspiring as, as um, I did. Um, and the first time I actually saw that, um, I was actually live with Tiana when she was doing this as part of our conference. Um, and it was a it was a little difficult for me anyways, because I was the moderator. I was in your position, Jamie. Um, and I was crying at the end of it. So um, I was a really crappy moderator <laughs> on, on that day. So but but I do um, honestly hope that 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 all of you um, in attendance today did find that um, of interest. Um, and I'm happy. I mean, I realize that we're kind of bumping right up against um, our time. But if anybody did have any questions or comments or um, anything that you would like to, to share, I am happy to try to um, answer or respond to any of that. Todd, I just wanted to share a comment that came in um, 
Uh, she says, thank you, Todd. I am at a loss for words. Amazing. And I just think that I just want to share that. I feel I feel that way too. Um, <laughs> just said, what an impactful presentation. Um, so moving. So I don't, I don't, I, I don't see, let me see if here's the comment. Um, Outstanding, like the comparison between her tribe and the bird. Yeah, just fascinating, uh, super fascinating. Yes. And I, I suppose that is one thing that, you know, perhaps just to kind of like leave everyone um, with, and I was talking to um, Jamie about this, that one of the recently, as, as we're kind of like getting close to COP26, and, you know, everybody is like, you know, really kind of focused on um, a lot of the different international collaborations that are going on that we're, we're going to have to do to, to address climate, the climate crisis. Um, I've been very excited to actually see indigenous and native um, people and nations being represented um, at the highest level and actually having a chance to express their voice. But one of the things that I think is very important, and, and, and I would kind of hope that all of you would kind of like take this away, is that oftentimes, um, Native nations or indigenous people can actually be looked at as victims um, of ecological um, and environmental racism. Um, and that's true. <laughs> but then, you know, we're all actually victims of um, an awful lot of the damage that's been done to, to our ecology around the world. But what's more important to me and what I think that Tiana and, and the work that she's doing um, really shows is that the Native nations are actually like really, they're doers. They're not they're not passive victims. I mean, they are out there actually like leading the charge on this. Um, and the work that Tiana is doing is absolutely amazing. And I've had the good fortune over the last 20 years um, to meet so many people in the 574 different federally recognized tribes across the, the country, as well as other indigenous communities um, around the world who are doing the same thing. Um, and I, that's the one thing that kind of like gives me hope um, every day that I have to get up and go into the front lines and actually like fight on, on these kind of things is um, these kind of things are actually happening out there and really fantastic work is being done. And it's being done scientifically validly, but, and, but also for like from a cultural perspective as well as the ecological perspective. And I think that that's really important for all of us to um, remember. So I hope that that inspiration and, and that sense of hope is, is something that you can all kind of like walk away with um, as well. Absolutely. Um, so Todd, a question, and then we also have a question coming in through the Q&A is, what can people in Pennsylvania by Hawk Mountain or people anywhere watching, um, people who are not necessarily members of the Native Nations, what can um, other people do to help support members of the Native Nations? Great, great question. Um, <laughs> Uh, it kind of complicated. Um, and I warned Jamie ahead of time, I have a tendency to go off on tangents. Um, and so since I realized that our, our time is precious here, I'm going to try to actually stay um, on, um, on, on task with this. One of the things that I would actually say is, um, especially for, you know, for, for folks in Pennsylvania, we're at a really um, a major turning point that actually has just recently happened. And this was what I actually ended up doing for my opening plenary actually for this year's conference is I invited the representatives from the seven tribes in Virginia who have recently received federal recognition. That has been a long, long standing um, struggle for them. So even in your neck of the woods, I mean, you have these tribes that have been there since time immemorial who were the first tribal native nations to actually meet the Europeans at, at, at Jamestown who have finally got federal recognition. If you would like to actually kind of like, you know, just reach out, I think one of the biggest things that, that people can do who, who are not members of, of a native nation is just simply listen, learn about those. Um, you have a lot of these native nations like immediately around your area. Up in New York, there's lots and lots of different native nations that I've worked with up there. Listen, learn from them and recognize the fact that, I mean, they have, they have a story to actually um, share. Um, that would be one, one thing. I think even more importantly, though, is continue the work that you're actually doing in your communities. That's, that's probably like more important is like these Native nations, the Yurok tribe is actually doing this because these um, animals are actually relations. And Tiana would oftentimes like refer to that. You know, they are members of the wildlife community. The birds, 
the fish, the reptiles, the amphibians that you all are actually working with and the work that you're doing are also your relations. Um, and so maybe like take that little kind of lesson away. If you're working on your patch, that actually is helping everyone. And that's what I would think would actually probably be the most important, the most important lesson. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, all right, we have a question. Um, were there recently two female offspring of California condors that resulted from parthen parthogenesis? Is, is this true? I have not heard that. Um, that is something I would have to actually look into. That's That would be news, news to me. So yeah, I'm, I'm honestly not sure. I've heard of it. Yeah, I'm, I'm not familiar as well, um, but very interesting. Um, and another question, Todd, for you began talking about the Tribal Environmental Conference. Mm -hmm. um, so is that, can, can anyone who wants to attend, attend, or do you have to be a, a member of a certain organization or group? Is it invite only? How does that work? It is totally open to everyone. Um, and we have, when we were doing them in person, we would have around 550 or so people um, as I mentioned, we did the last two virtually. Um, we had over 900 people and people would come in from all over the world. Um, you do not have to be an employee of a federal agency. You don't have to be a, an employee of a, of a, of a tribe. Um, we have everybody from local conservationists to college students that actually come to it. One of the things that I will actually do is Jamie, after this presentation, um, I will send you a couple of links um, so that you can go ahead and send those out to everybody who had, who had registered. Yes. Um, I will send you the, the Yurok Tribes Wildlife um, page so you can actually go check out some of the awesome work that Tiana is doing. I will send you the link to um, the organization I work with. And one of the things that I'll do is I'll actually send direct links. You can go and actually watch all the recordings from the 2021 Tribal Lands and Environment Forum as well as the 2020 um, since we did both of them virtually. Um, I'll warn you right now, most of them are probably actually going to be, I mean, unless you're really, really interested in underground storage tank regulation, um, <laughs> might, might be a little on the boring side. But I do want to kind of mention that um, because we were doing these virtually, it opened up certain possibilities. For my 2020, I actually had Robin Wall Kimmerer um, as my um, opening plenary speaker. And many of you may be familiar with her. She is the author of Braiding Sweetgrass. Um, which is, right. I think, one of the most amazing books ever written. Um, I would highly recommend that to all of you. Um, and she was an incredibly gracious and beautiful person um, who gave a really fantastic presentation. So you can actually go for free and actually watch that. So. Thank you so much. Yeah, I will definitely forward uh, all those uh, resources and links to everyone who registered. And actually, we have a comment from uh, Miss Bree Bennett. Hi, Bree. Um, in response to the parthenogenesis question, she said um, the parthenogenesis in California condors was just published in Animal Heredity today. Hot off the press. Brand wow. new. <laughs> The, oh, sorry, she said it's the Journal of Hereditary, Heredity. So um, I don't feel bad I didn't know that because I did not okay. yet. So <laughs> yeah. um, that's fascinating. That is fascinating. I can't wait to check that out. Um, thank you, Bree, for sharing that. Very much so. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so uh, Todd, I just thank you so much. Um, this was Absolutely amazing, um, very moving, so inspiring. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you for your, your passion and all the energy, all these positive things you're doing. And please extend our sincere gratitude uh, to Tiana as well for you know, sharing her presentation with us and you know, allowing us to record it and share it with a wider audience um, online as well. So thank you so much. I, I certainly will. And Thank you to Hawk Mountain. Um, thank you, Jamie. And thank you to everybody who actually attended. I really appreciate the opportunity. Oh, absolutely. Our, thanks to you. And, um, you know, I, I do have to end with promoting some upcoming uh, programs we have at Hawk Mountain. Um, so it's fall migration. We had some great flight days this week. Come visit us. We have lots of free programs, including live Raptors of Close programs throughout migration weekends. Um, this Saturday, the 30th, we have Halloween from two to four. And even though it might be a little bit rainy, it is indoor. You don't want to miss it. Lots of owls, lots of cool interactions, and also lots of candy. <laughs> um, this is Sunday morning. This Sunday morning, we have yoga on the mountain. 
which we typically have the last Sunday of every month. So check that out. Um, Wednesday, November 3rd, we have our We Ones Walk, Lovely Leaves is the theme. And then we have 7 p.m. actually on the 3rd, we have another autumn lecture series webinar, and that is Acoustic Bat Survey Kiosk for Public Outreach and Research. And that is focusing on the bat kiosk and research being done at Hawk Mountain. Um, Saturday, um, November 6th is Eagle Day at Hawk Mountain, which um, I don't know, Todd, if I had to choose between IVAD and Eagle Day, oh, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. They're both two of my favorite days. That's all I can say. You don't want to miss that. We have live uh, eagle presentations at noon and 2 p.m. guaranteed to see bald eagle and golden eagle up close and personal. <laughs> and then also on the 6th is our last autumn lecture series uh, for the season. And that is on site in our visitor center gallery with our own Rebecca McCabe, uncovering the mysteries of the snowy owl. Um, we have some children's basket weaving workshops coming up on the 7th and then also an adult uh, basket weaving workshop um, on the 14th. Homeschool happenings, animal behavior on November 17th. And our next stay at home speaker series is on November 18th. Um, Kikoldi, the story of the Raptor Count site within the Central American Flyway connecting North and South America. So that's what's in store at Hawk Mountain. Thank you all so much for listening. And um, Todd, again, much gratitude to you. Um, we hope to see you all again on the mountain soon. Have a, a good rest of your day or evening. Bye for now. Bye-bye.